It's a real honor and a privilege to be here and to introduce Victoria Talwar, professor uh, who is a worldwide expert in uh, children's deception. And uh, I think uh, on a personal note, it's a real, real privilege for our research group, who's also involved in doing research in child deception, uh, to, to have her here directly. I still remember when I submitted our first grant in this direction that we kept citing the Talwar and Crossman 2011 review. It was the, like a sort of a very seminal paper that we had, and uh, I can't believe you are really here. Uh, so, uh, to, to uh, just give you some uh, ideas about uh, Professor Talwar's work, she's a Mc James McGill Professor, Chair of the Department of Education and Counseling at McGill, and uh, has uh, done a lot of research, but also an extensive work with training practitioners who work with children, not just for detect detecting deception, as you will hear, but for understanding the phenomenon better. She has received several distinguished awards, uh, is an American Psychological Association Fellow and a Fellow of the Association for Psychological Science and member of the College of the Royal Society of Canada. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation and looking forward to hearing your talk. I want to thank Laura for inviting me. Um, it's very exciting to be here after all the uh, drama of the last uh, few years and to see people in person. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, children's verbal deception. That is um, when children make verbal statements to intentionally mislead others. Um, so looking at their lie telling behavior and in particular today I'm going to focus on sort of uh, research that is pertinent and relevant to child witness testimony and in forensic context. So, so where I first started was well we knew anecdotally that people say that children tell lies but when do children start telling these lies and how do we examine this behavior because if you think about it um, when I lie, if I tell a lie, I don't suddenly sort of tell the lie and then say, I just told a lie. We don't uh, let people know we tell a lie because the whole point is to be, is to get away with the lie. So if we're successful, then it's a concealed behavior that other people do, uh, don't know that we have done. So it's this private concealed behavior. So it's tricky to examine this experimentally because if I were to just go to a playground and to observe children or a shopping precinct and observe adults, they might tell lies, they might make verbal statements that are deceptive, but I might not necessarily know that they've done it because I need to be able to verify if their statements are true and false. I need to know what ground truth is. So we need to create situations where children's lies can be observable and verifiable, that we know what ground truth is. We also, um, you know, it's, we don't tend to um, tell people, okay, you tell a lie, you tell a truth. That could be a parlor game. But in reality, there's a certain artificiality if we assign people to uh, conditions of giving us false reports and truth reports. So we also wanted to create situations where the person can, um, the child can spontaneously decide to tell a lie. Because that's what we do in real life. We make the decision. Um, that for um, our interpersonal goals that we feel that we need to lie and to give a deceptive statement. So we wanted to create situations where children's lies were na uh, elicited uh, naturally and spontaneously. And finally, um, I always get this question um, within, whenever I'm speaking to forensic or psychology law audiences, which is, Okay, Victoria, that's interesting, but are these situations the same as the situations where children are testifying in court? And the simple and quick answer to that is no. Because we have to do this within an ethical framework, so we can't cause harm to children. And often children are testifying about cases that are quite serious in nature, such as abuse. Um, um, ethically, we can't create an abuse situation in the lab. So we have to create situations that are analogous, that have features that are analogous to the types of situations they have. And so that's also another reason why to look at it spontaneously, because when you're lying, there's um, an emotional component to it. You're a little bit fearful. Maybe the person's not going to believe you. Maybe you're not going to get, 
get away with this lie, um, as opposed to when we've instructed someone to lie and they know that you already know that you know, they're lying and it's almost condoned. So we've looked at a whole range of different types of lies in my lab. That's the bit, that's the creative bit where we have to sit and figure out how can we create a situation that uh, uh, meets all these features to it. And, and one of the earliest types of lies, which I'm going to start off with, is that children tell are lies to conceal their own transgressions. So these are lies to sort of escape negative consequences when you've done something you're not supposed to, like eating a cookie that you weren't supposed to before dinner, or an adult doing something at work which causes the computer to crash, and they say, who, who touched this computer last? Oh, I don't know who touched this computer. Um, we tell lies for personal gain to get something we want. I don't know. In Canada, people have to do income tax, and people sometimes lie on the income tax in order to you know, get more money. Um, we can, uh, so these are very sort of self-serving lies, and um, often referred to as antisocial lies. They're really for our, serve our own purposes and our own interpersonal goals. But on the other end of the spectrum, there are lies that are mother, more other-oriented. So these could be lies to be uh, polite, like, oh, I love this fish tie you got me for Christmas. Um, and these are lies to sort of protect the other person's feelings. Um, we can also tell lies to be altruistic, where there's a potential cost to ourselves, but there's um, um, a gain for someone else. Um, so for instance, to give you a real world example, during Nazi occupation, there are people who um, concealed and lied to protect Jewish people. There was a potential cost, a real world cost to themselves if they were discovered in their lie, but there was, they were lying for um, principles of justice and uh, care and well-being for humans. So um, they were sort of putting those principles above um, the, the need to be honest. So we can lie even for altruistic reasons. So our lies can stem from uh, self-oriented to other-oriented. And then there are lies to conceal another's transgression, which kind of sort of border a, a little bit, um, and they blur the lines in that they are other-oriented in that we're lying to uh, potentially protect another person's interests. So for instance, giving an alibi for someone who's committed a crime, so they are other-oriented, but they also can be antisocial in that they are protecting someone who has committed a crime, for instance. So today I'm going to focus on lies that are the types of lies that are most pertinent in the forensic and psychology law arenas, which are um, lies where children are lying to conceal their own um, transgression about their own behavior or about the behavior of others. So. Um, where we started with this was we created a situation to look at the earliest lies that children tell, which is lies to conceal their transgression. And we adopted the Sears Alport and Ra temptation resistance paradigm, which they had developed in the 1960s to look at children's ability to resist temptation. And we, ado uh, we adapted this to look at children's lie telling behavior. So in this um, experiment, uh, we have different toys, and you bring the toys out, and they make uh, different sounds. So in this example, you see up on the on the screen, there's a baby. The child's back is to the toy, so they can't know what it is. And you squeeze the toy, and in this case, it's a baby. It makes a crying noise, and the child gets to guess what it is. And we have a big bag full of lots of different toys that are age appropriate for the children that we're looking at, and also are often ones they know, so different character TV characters that are popular at the time. Um, so you see here in the setup, and the, uh, we play this a few times. So in the first one, there's Elmo. And you squeeze Elmo, and Elmo makes his character sound. And then the experiment is asked, well, what do you think it is? And the child gets excited and says, it's Elmo. And they're told repeatedly they're not allowed to look at the toy. And then at the end, they can turn around and play with the toy. So they play this a few times. And um, for the last target toy, we put a toy up on the table. So in this example, it's uh, Mickey Mouse. And um, the experimenter says, oops, I forgot uh, something in the other room, so I have to go get it. I'm going to play the last toy for you, and you have to guess what it is, but don't peek. So they're emphatically told they're not allowed to look. And then the researcher leaves the room. And so that we know what ground truth is, there's a hidden camera in the room, which captures what they do while they are, um, the experimenter's out of the room. 
and also notably um, for the target toy, the noise that's being played is not associated with the toy, the character, so they can't easily guess it based upon the sound that they hear. And then the researcher leaves the room for a minute, comes back in, making a noisy entrance, and uh, says to the child, uh, did you turn around and peek at the toy to see if they will tell the truth or lie about what they did? And then they are asked two follow-up questions to see if they're able to maintain the plausibility of their uh, initial statement, which is, what do you think the toy is and how do you know it's whatever they say it is? So um, hopefully this video will work. Um, you're gonna see a little boy in this situation where if you, right at the very beginning, you're gonna hear a click um, as the experimenter leaves and you're gonna see what this little boy does. So as you see, um, very fast. Um, in our North American samples, they, they peak at that age pretty fast. They can't resist temptation. And so um, uh, what we find, as you see, is the majority of children peak, which was good news for us because we needed to create a situation where they would transgress in order to see if they would then lie about it. So then we um, then ask them, well, did you turn around and peek at the toy? And what we find is that the majority of children four years and above do lie and say, no, they didn't peek. Um, but you'll notice that there's significantly less three-year-olds um, lie. And this has been replicated over and over by us and others that uh, children under four are, uh, lie at a lower rate. And it's not to about four that you get the majority of children lying. And this is related to their actual uh, cognitive abilities, their theory of mind. So those of you who do work with children know that children can pass the standard false belief uh, task at four years of age. And so younger children whose theory of mind abilities are still developing um, tend to lie at this uh, lower rate. And in fact, the emergence seems to appear in the preschool years and it's tied to their uh, theory of mind ability. So that gets to the next question. So we know that they, we found that they lie and this lying emerges in the preschool years, but what about their lie telling skills? Can children be convincing lie tellers? So to do that, we need to look at their expressive behavior, both their nonverbal behavior to make sure that their facial expressions and their body clues do not arouse um, suspicion. Um, we call this nonverbal leakage control and also the verbal um, abilities to make sure that the content of their verbal statements do not con uh, contradict their initial lie statement. And we call this semantic leakage control. So we first showed this to undergrads and parents to see if they could detect children. Um, and what we found was that they were um, pretty much at chance or below chance. So those of you who do research with adults, for instance, are not at all surprised at this. Adults are not good at detecting lies, and we found that, and uh, uh, several meta-analyses have found that. And in fact, a meta-analysis came out recently that looked at adults' abilities to detect children's lies, and, in fact, and indeed, we're kind of not very good. We're about 54%. Um, so that was not, um, that and subsequently is not surprising. This originally was uh, done at the early 2000s. Um, but also interestingly, I always get asked the question, well, were there gender differences? Do you find gender differences? And just to preempt that question, the answer is no. Not reliably, not consistently, and not frequently. So at this age, we're not finding a lot of gender differences in this type of lie and in the other types of lies. Um, but what we did find interestingly in this study was we found when adults were rating the, um, and trying to distinguish the lie tellers from the truth tellers, they were more likely to rate boys as lie tellers, even though boys were not more likely to be lie tellers than the girls. So there seemed to be a bias. I think boys um, are little liars when it comes to their misdeeds. Um, so we thought, okay, well, the adults are not really good at this, but maybe they're still leaking something. So if we have trained coders code their nonverbal behavior, maybe they're still leaking some um, expressive, nonverbal expressive behavior. So we coded uh, frame by frame 36 different behaviors, and we found a couple of differences. We found that the liars had much bigger smiles, and the truth tellers, ha um, the non-liars had more relaxed mouth. So Paul Ekman would call this duping delight. Did you peek at the toy? No. But the important thing to know is we coded 36 behaviors and we didn't really find much except for this. 
So, and second, we do not find this reliably. So if you look across different lie contexts, different situations, this is not a reliable marker of lie telling. There's no Pinocchio's nose, um, there's no nonverbal behavior that all children show um, in uh, lying situations. So not really, we can't really distinguish them on the nonverbal behavior. But what we have found, um, and subsequent research has found, is that you can distinguish them on their verbal behavior. When we look at children's ability to maintain the plausibility of their lie, to answer follow-up questions, young children are not very good at it. Um, they are poor lie tellers and they have difficulty maintaining their lies when asked follow-up questions. And as you see from this graph, um, we've us and others have looked at it all the way up the age range, and you see that by eight, nine years of age, that is when they are starting to get uh, better at maintaining their lies. So what are the underlying mechanisms that um, uh, under this development? Well, I'm going to briefly uh, talk about this before I move on to other uh, situations that are forensically relevant. But essentially, there's been a lot of research. So a lot of research in the last two decades is really concentrated on looking at the development of lying in relation to the children's cognitive development. And what we have found and others have found that it's related to the emergence and the development of children's lie-telling abilities is related to their theory of mind, their understanding of other mental states, and um, other people's mental states and their executive functioning. So research has found that it's related to their inhibitory control, their working memory, their planning, and their cognitive flexibility. And in fact, just recently, two meta-analysis came out which confirmed this relationship um, that theory of mind and executive functioning are related to the emergence and the development of lying in children. So more recently, uh, researchers have turned their attention to look at the role of the social environment and motivational context. A lot of that research is looking at the role of parenting. Um, but what I'm going to talk briefly about today is the, one of the earliest studies to look at the role of the uh, social environment because I think it's pertinent to understanding how the motivational context can really influence children's decisions about whether they um, lie or not and is relevant to sort of the situations we're thinking about. About. So this was a, um, a study, I was in um, West Africa doing some other research and while I was there um, I uh, took advantage of a uh, situation that allowed me to do a naturalistic experiment. So children were in the same neighborhood, were in two school, private schools and one uh, was a, had a corporal punishment discipline model. So they had a very punitive authoritarian colonial uh, discipline, uh, discipline model where they would um, hit or slap children um, or beat them with a stick which was kind of the same shape as a baseball bat but kind of half the size uh, for various fences like you know getting their math questions wrong to acting out. Um, Compared to another private school where the children had a non corporal punishment, where they got verbal reprimands, timeouts, so they had to go outside the classroom, or for more major offenses, they were sent to the principal's office. And we put them in a TRP. And um, uh, we found that when we looked at their uh, lie telling behavior, we found that. Children in the punitive environment, the corporal punishment school, were significantly more likely to lie than children in the non-corporal punishment school, and we had a Canadian comparison group. But not only that, when we looked at their ability to maintain their lies and follow up questions, children from the punitive environment were significantly better at maintaining their lies than children from the other, the non-corporal and the Canadian comparison group. At this young age, they're not normally very good at maintaining their lies, but these children were much, much, it was striking how much better they were at maintaining their lies. Um, and so if you think about it, if you're in a harsh punitive environment, where you're going to get into a lot of trouble, even for minor offenses, you might as well go for broke and lie about it to try and mitigate some of that uh, negative impact on you. But if you're going to do, try such a strategy, you really, it needs to be successful. Um, so you need to learn how to lie and lie well fast. So it does suggest that uh, lying may actually be, in some cases, an adaptive strategy in um, harsh punitive environments to help them with those environments or to help mitigate the consequences of antisocial behavior. 
So it may be that um, some, si some social um, environmental situations actually lie telling is a way to cope with that, um, cope with those environments. And in fact, research with adolescents and adults that has looked at their perceptions of lies and found that adolescents and adults endorse lying in sort of harsh totalitarian, authoritarian kind of uh, governments or um, authority figures um, as justifiable in such situations. So in those situations, we may um, use lying as a way to deal with those situations. So moving on to situations that are often of concern in the court. So often a concern is raised in courts when children are testifying of a fear of their, uh, their uh, reports are coached and that they're or that they may keep a secret for an instigator um, so we actually wanted to look at this um, experimentally so we started looking at this and the first study we did was we looked at children's lies for their parents because children um, often when they're in courts they are um, giving uh, testifying about someone's behavior and sometimes it's someone that's very close to them so we had children um, 3 to 11 years of age and they came into the lab with their parents and the parents had been, uh, they were playing the confederate in the study, so the parents knew what to do. And they went into a room, and there were toys in the room, and they, um, there was a puppet in the corner, and uh, very clearly said, do not touch, and that, that was kind of off limits. And while the researcher was out of the room, the parent would say, oh, look at this, and pick it up. And um, what would happen was uh, the marbles in that base would, cr would come pouring out, and for the purposes of the picture, I corralled them in a glass jar. But in reality, they would just go and go all over the room. So there was no way that they could fix it. Marbles were everywhere, and the head would just pop off. Um, uh, so it was really broken. And the parents would then go, oh my goodness, look what I've done, and I wasn't supposed to touch it. Don't tell anyone. So they asked the children to keep it a secret. And then later, children were interviewed by an interviewer about what happened to the puppet. And we had children in three conditions. In the dark blue condition, the parent was absent when they were interviewed about what happened. In the uh, light blue condition, the parent was present. So the instigator was present during the interview. And in the purple one, the children actually had an alibi when the crime happened, when the transgression happened. Um, so this protected their self-interest. They knew that they could not be blamed for the transgression. And you see in the purple one, they were significantly more likely to, uh, when their self-interests were protected, they were more likely to keep their parents secret and uh, lie about it. But please note that um, less than half of the children concealed to the lie. So you see that marker there, under 50% of children overall lie to to keep their parents' transgression a secret. So we know that children can keep another's transgression a secret and that younger children are not good at maintaining their reports. But then how does the amount of coaching influence children's reports? And that one, you know, the, the, the parent just said, you know, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. Don't tell anyone. It was really minimal. So if we look at their actual, we wanted to look at the influence of heavy versus light coaching on children's reports. So in this study, we had children interact with a research assistant at their home. The research assistant came to their home and played games with them. They were sort of, no one else was in the room. It was just them and the research assistant um, playing games. And then in the intervening week, they were coached by the parent to say that they played a game with the research assistant that actually involved touching their body and placing stickers on their body. Um, and um, then a week later, they were interviewed by a different researcher. And so we asked parents to keep a log of their coaching, uh, the amount of time they spent coaching the children to uh, give this false report, this false allegation. And we had that, so for low, we characterized them as low, so low was on average about 20 minutes. Moderate was on average about 45 minutes, and um, high was um, on average 90 minutes. And what you see is that um, when children had low amount of coaching, um, these children are young children. They are not; they weren't that great at maintaining the false allegation, or they sort of they they confessed it up, or they revealed it in some way. But when they had moderate, so on average 45 minutes or more of coaching, they were significantly better at maintaining the false allegation. Um, 
so we wanted to look at this a little bit more, um, and so we did this one, this study in the lab where we then um, uh, manipulated within the lab the amount of coaching that we did. Um, so in this situation, uh, children uh, pled with a confederate, and the confederate, there was a toy box which was off limits. There were other toys in the rooms, but this one was an off limits one, and the confederate, while they were alone with the child, would say, oh, let's play with it, it's okay, no one will ever know. And they open up the box and they take out the toys and show them to the ch child and they interact with the child, and then the confederate breaks one of the toys. So they played with this box, so they're not even supposed to be playing with it, and then they break something. So they put it all back and they close it up. And they ask the child to keep the transgression a secret. Don't tell anyone um, that I did this. And there were three conditions. There was the no coaching condition, where they essentially just asked them to keep a secret, um, uh, but didn't sort of um, do any practice. In the light coaching, they practiced answering um, some questions about, you know, what happened and if, if um, they had um, opened up the toy box. And the heavy coaching, they did the practice of the questions, but they also, the, um, the instigator, the confederate, helped them uh, come up with a cover story about what they actually had been doing during that time. That was completely nothing to do with the toy box. And so you see in the yellow bar that's no coaching and the blue bar is light coaching. And you see in the four to five yards, the red bar, which is heavy coaching. When they had heavy coaching, they were significantly better at maintaining their reports. But for the older children, uh, six, seven-year-olds, even having some uh, light coaching, the blue bar and the red bar, they're significantly better at uh, maintaining the reports. So for young children, because they are, their cognitive buildings are still developing and they're not very good at maintaining the reports, it takes quite a lot of coaching for them to be able to maintain these reports uh, compared to uh, little older children. So, to summarize, we've looked at a lot of factors, but I want to move on to look at sort of truth promotion factors. But we've looked at a lot of different factors that affect whether children will lie and tell the uh, truth or, or whether, whether they'll disclose what has happened, um, including uh, event and child variables. So as I said, social cognition plays a role. That's a child variable. They're developing cognitive abilities means they're better able to maintain lies. They have the, the tools to do that. Um, also, child's perception of the event has been found to have an effect, so their perception of the consequences if they disclose or not. Um, also moral emotions um, and fear, so for instance, if, um, if they feel shame about an event, they might be uh, more hesitant to disclose. Um, instigator variables can also influence, so coaching, as I've, um, uh, as I've spoken about, also the relationship with the instigator. So we recently, in a recent study, we measured their, how uh, familiar and comfortable they felt with the instigator, and when they felt really familiar and really uh, comfortable and had high likability with the instigator, they were more likely to keep the instigator secret than when they didn't. Um, interview variables, so questioning types. Uh, we've looked at, you know, how uh, questioning type um, impacts whether children will disclose uh, truthfully or not. Uh, repeated interviews, we found that uh, with repeated interviews, children's true and false reports become more and more similar and it's really hard to distinguish them. So even young children who are not good at maintaining with re repetition is sort of practice. We've also looked at relationship to the interviewer, and I'm going to speak more about that in a moment, and also um, instructions, and I'll speak more about that. So the next few studies I want to talk about is what I think is really important uh, in the forensic um, situations and developmentally, which is um, what are factors that can promote tr children's truthful reports? So. Um, how can we overcome the influence of coaching then, if this is a, a concern? Well, one of the um, simplest ways and effective ways that have, has been repeatedly shown is that just asking promise to tell the truth decreases lying. So in our first study, which we did in 2002, we found that when we asked children promise to tell the truth, it decreased their lie-telling behavior about their own transgressions. They were more likely to tell the truth. Uh, we also did, found that uh, when we looked at their uh, ability, uh, their uh, lie telling for others, so for instance in, the, in this study with the parents' transgression, we gave them a second interview and children were asked, will you promise to tell the truth before the interview? And you saw that significantly less children um, uh, uh, lied then. They were much more likely to tell the truth. 
And in fact, um, so this and many other studies have found that promo uh, promising to tell the truth uh, increases honesty. So as a result, best practices now suggest that the best thing to ask in the instructions, uh, as part of the instructions, is to ask children, do you promise that you will tell the truth? Because um, our research and others subsequently have found that simply asking children five years of age and older to promise to tell the truth reduces lie telling. It doesn't wipe it out, but it seems to um, alert them and remind them to the importance of telling the truth and um, sort of create a commitment in their minds about the importance of telling the truth. Um, another um, technique that's been used by Angela Evans and Xiaoping Ding is the um, looking at self-awareness. So in this study, which was done by Xiaoping Ding, um, it, there was Chinese children three to four years of age, and they had three conditions. The control was a TRP, just a standard temptation resistance paradigm. Then they had a self-awareness condition where there was a mirror, and the children would look at the mirror, and they'd say their name, and they'd become aware of themselves in the mirror before they were asked about their uh, peaking behavior. And then the um, other awareness was where they saw a photo of a peer. So they became aware of their peer kind of there watching them in this photograph before they were asked about it. And what you see here in the graph is that in the blue bar, which is where they had a mirror, they were significantly more likely to tell the truth. So there was higher truth telling in this preschool age. And so um, just recently, Angela Evans and I, um, COVID kind of uh, somewhat stymied us in doing this study, but we had started it before COVID and had to finish it after. Um, we uh, were looking at um, promising and self-awareness to find out what was the most important, uh, most effective truth promotion method. And so we had children do a TRP and they were in four honesty promotion conditions. One was they were asked to promise to tell the truth. The second one was self-awareness. They had a mirror and they made, were aware of themselves. The third one was a promise plus self-awareness condition. And then we had a control with no, no truth induction. Um, and if you can see in this graph, so if you look to the left, um, that's three to four year olds. And you see that the light blue bar, which is a self-awareness condition, significantly less children are lying in that condition at three to four years of age. But the other um, uh, methods are not having as, as, good, as profound an effect. But when, if you look to the right of this and you look to the seven and eight, you see the blue bar, which is promising to tell the truth, and the red bar, which is promising to tell the truth plus the mirror, they are having an effect on children's um, uh, uh, truth telling and they're more likely to tell the truth. They were less likely to lie in that condition. So what it suggests is that different truth promotions may have different effects with different ages. It seems that, for instance, under five years of age, promising doesn't have an effect, but um, this self-awareness method does. But older than that, um, especially with the older kids, promising does have this an effect. So those, both the self-awareness and the truth promotion conditions are conditions that um, sort of alert yourself to your own personal commitment to be honest. But there are other ways that you can be sort of prompted um, or um, to think about um, the importance of being honest or the consequences. And one is observing another person's honesty or dishonesty. So in this study, my graduate student Persky and Garis did a study where a confederate broke her, her, her glasses and she was out of the room. And children then observed the confederate either tell the truth with a positive outcome so Presky was pleased with them for telling the truth, or with a negative outcome, she, was, she got upset, a lie-telling condition with positive outcome, they were uh, believed, um, or a lie-telling condition with negative outcome, they were not believed and she was upset, and a control condition that, um, where they didn't observe um, truth or lie-telling. And then children were put in a, a standard TR, a temptation resistance paradigm, and to look at when, after they had observed all this that happened later, they were put in that to see if that af affected their own truth or lie-telling behavior about their own transgression. And what we found was that children were significantly less likely to lie when they saw the model, when they'd seen a model tell the truth with positive outcomes. They were also significantly less likely to lie when they saw a model lie with negative outcomes. So what it's suggesting is that children are really uh, taking in information by observing others about, and that's affecting their decisions about whether they truth and lie, but also they're taking in information about the consequences of telling the truth or lying. 
And another study that speaks to this is a study done with uh, Kong Lee, which looked at um, the different stories that we tell, sort of different moral fables that we tell children about honesty. Um, so we started this study in uh, San Diego, um, and it was, uh, we gave children the um, Pinocchio story, um, uh, we gave the children who, the boy who cried wolf story, and we also give children the George Washington and the Cherry Tree story. For those of you who don't know the George Washington and the Cherry Tree story, it's, a, it's probably an apocryphal story, but it's a story about George who gets all excited because he's got a new ax and he goes and in his enthusiasm cuts down his father's beloved, one of his father's beloved cherry trees and his father's very upset and says, uh, who cut down my cherry tree, and George says, Father, I cannot tell a lie. It was me who cut down your cherry tree. And the father is pleased with him for being honest and telling the truth. We also had a control story, which was the tortoise and the hare, which has nothing to do with honesty. And what you'll see here is that uh, significantly less children lied in the George Washington story. And so we thought, well, this story, um, the character models honesty. He tells the truth about his transgression and he, um, there's positive consequences. Because if you think about it, lying, you know, if you have motivation to lie because you're afraid of what's going to happen, um, lying might seem the easier choice, right? So you have to overcome that motivation. And so it may be in conditions where they see someone be honest about a hard thing, like confessing a transgression about something that you are a little hesitant to admit to, you see a character uh, confess to it, and then you see that there are positive consequences, like the earth does not fall down on top of you. That can maybe potentially be a powerful uh, uh, message to children to alert them to, okay, maybe I can tell the truth about this. So then the question was, can an instigator's influence be overcome then? Um, uh, when they've been extensionally uh, coached to make false reports. So uh, again, we use this, uh, this paradigm with the forbidden toy chest and the breaking of the toy. And in this study, the, uh, the research assistant asked them uh, to keep it a secret and um, because uh, that they broke it and then they gave them extensive coaching with a cover story. And then the children were interviewed by the research assistant about what they did with the um, uh, by another research assistant. And they, before they were asked the substantive interview, they were given one of three stories, a positive moral story where the character tells the truth, positive outcomes, negative moral story, um, lie telling with negative outcomes, and a neutral story. And we found once again that in the positive story, which emphasized the positive consequences of honesty, this increased uh, children's honesty. Um, also speaking to uh, children's expectations of consequences and how this may play, this is playing a significant role in their decision making about whether they're going to lie or whether they're going to disclose the truth, uh, we did a study where we uh, manipulated and crossed the expectation of negative consequences, so get punishment for their transgression versus uh, no punishment for their transgression, and appeals to tell the truth. So external social factors such as pleasing in, uh, another person, if you tell me the truth, I'll be really pleased with you. Um, versus internal social factors. If, um, if you tell the truth, you'll be pleased with yourself because it's the right thing to do. And we looked at that, and if you look at the blue balls first, so we put them in a temptation resistance paradigm, and we found that when there was no expectation of punishment uh, for the transgression, both the internal appeal and the external appeal seemed to a significant impact and that children were significantly less likely to lie in those conditions. They were much more likely to tell the truth. Um, but when they had an expectation of punishment, there's expectation of negative consequences for their transgression, only the external appeal seemed to attenuate that uh, fear um, and you had a drop in uh, uh, lie telling only in that condition, but not as much as when there was no punishment. So this speaks more to how children are looking at the cost-benefit analysis of deciding, you know, what is a better thing to do in this situation? Um, is it better for me to lie or is it better for me to tell the truth? And how um, messages that they are receiving may be attenuating that motivation to a lesser or greater extent. So the last study that I'm gonna talk about is um, one we just um, did, um, which was looking at more the rapport building uh, uh, with the interviewer. 
So importantly, in an interview, or we want, in an interview, we want to support child witnesses to feel comfortable to disclose. We already have spoken about there may be motivations to hide or to not give the true story. So we wanted to say, well, um, and they're, they're often being interviewed by, you know, interviewers who are not familiar to them, who are strangers to them. How can we create, um, increase rapport building that they might be, feel more comfortable to disclose to the so in this uh, situation, uh, we used, again, we've used this in other studies um, that we've looked at uh, when we were looking at other uh, uh, questioning types. But in this study, we used um, a paradigm we've used called the, uh, the theft paradigm, where basically they witness someone steal $20. So they're witnessing an actual crime, and, they will, and the uh, person who steals the $20 asks them to uh, keep it a secret. And in this study, we manipulated the rapport building phase prior to the substantive interview. So a lot of research has found that, you know, rapport building, asking children, suggest asking children personal questions about themselves can help to establish rapport. And best practices, you know, children would then receive actually narrative practice where they would be asked, you know, maybe about their birthday or about some prior event um, other than the, the actual event and um, to also give them free narrative practice. And a lot of research has shown that when that is done, children really feel, um, are really much more able to give uh, more detailed answers. Um, so we looked at that, and then in another condition, we wanted to specifically create uh, conditions to try and increase the feelings of rapport with the interviewer. So uh, uh, my student, uh, Eder Foster, whose dissertation this was, she based this on, in the clinical literature, there's a lot of literature about the therapeutic alliance and about creating rapport between the client, uh, between the patient and the therapist. And so drawing from Tegel and Deegan's Rodenthal's uh, relational theory of rapport, which says there are three sort of interrelated components that are really important for establishing rapport, which is uh, mutual attentiveness, positivity, and coordination. So using those, she designed an interaction with them. In this case, it was learning a magic trick together to sort of uh, particularly hit on uh, increasing those three aspects in the uh, rapport building phase. And so, and she also, we measured whether children actually felt rapport. So we asked them how comfortable they were, and we also gave them uh, the charm C, which is an, a, a measure, um, a standardized measure of rapport. And what we found was the manipulation worked. Children felt significantly more rapport in this act, interactional rapport condition. And then when we look at children, so we gave them an interviewer where we give them uh, sort of uh, free recall, open-ended questions to, uh, uh, about what happened to elicit as much of their narrative as possible and then we asked some closed-ended questions at the end and you see about 70% of children concealed so the red is concealment and you see 70% of children actually concealed in the free recall and um, about 20% of children sort of disclosed uh, initially and then another 10% by the end of the free recall with some prompts uh, disclosed. So about 30% of children had disclosed by the end of the free recall. And um, overall of those children that did disclose, it was fewer older children attempted to conceal. So it was more older children that did disclose. Um, when we looked at the, but we also found an age by condition effect. So I know these screens are really small, so just essentially what you're seeing here is that first of all, by the end of the interview, about 45% uh, of children fully disclosed by the end of the interview. And when we look at open-ended questions on the left side, you see that children 10 to 13 year, age, 13 year olds of age were significantly more likely and also in the, by the end of the interview to disclose. Um, in the interactional rapport condition. So what we found was that older children were significantly more likely to be truthful and disclose the transgression. And we also looked at number of details, which I'm not showing on this graph, but they also gave more details in the interactional rapport building condition. So it seems that in particular, this helped the older children to feel comfortable to disclose the theft and, um, and uh, overcome their desire to protect the instigator. So just for conclusions, I know we're going on time, um, children's lie telling emerges in the preschool years. And um, children tell lies for both themselves and for others. And with age, children become better at maintaining their lies. However, I always like to note 
that children, like adults, will lie. There is no greater concern with children than there is with adults. Adults are motivated to get on the stand all the time and lie about various things. We don't get up in arms about adults in the same way that sometimes people get alarmists about children. So there is actually no greater risk for children lying on the stand than there is with adults. In fact, there might be even less concern because as we have seen repeatedly, young children are not skilled lie tellers whereas an adult might be very plausible indeed. So there is a potential here for developing methods of detection and also for truth promotion. Um, and so while, and I know that people, often defense lawyers, like to point out, oh, this might be a coach report. So yes, children can be coached to keep a secret, and coaching can affect the quality of children's true and false reports. Just because children are coached does not mean they will report the coach story. Remember, less than half of those children um, reported their parents, uh, 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 kept their parents' secret. Um, and whether they will do this is influenced by child, instigator, type of event, and interview factors, a whole host of ones beyond just the child. Um, so I really think that it's important to, to look at strategies to overcome coaching and overcome motivations to conceal or to make false allegations. And we can do that by developing methods of encouraging honesty. So far, the nascent research suggests that emphasizing um, and giving reminders of the importance of honesty has an impact. So just simply by asking children, uh, will you promise to tell the truth, it alerts them to the importance of telling the truth. Doesn't mean for sure that they will tell the truth, but uh, how many adults break their promises? Um, and then um, you can also, by modeling honesty and seeing positive consequences for honesty can impact their decision making, and also potentially creating conditions to increase their comfortability to disclose can also increase their truthful disclosures. But notably, what you're seeing there is that we see some evidence that there may be age differences, and that some things may work that work for younger children may not work for older children and vice versa. So we need to further investigate it to look at what works at different age ranges. And so the, really the next question I think that really needs to be studied in depth in many different ways is how do factors that promote honesty overcome these factors and motivational factors that promote lying? So I'll just end there and I'd like to thank um, my really creative uh, collaborators that I'm very grateful to work with and my wonderful graduate students and not the least all the many many children and parents who have given their time uh, to participate in our studies over the years so thank you